the only show focused on stars improvement strategies and the leaders who implement them. This is the Rising Stars with Rex Wallace Show, brought to you by Hyperlift. Hey everyone, welcome back to Rising Stars. Hey, a few months ago we had an episode called uh, WTF. Uh, no, not that WTF. We we were calling it What's the Future because we had just finished um, receiving the final role and uh, um, there was still a lot of unknown. Um, a lot of the things that we thought would be addressed in there were not addressed. So there was this tremendous amount of uncertainty. We thought we were going to have a second final role coming soon. And, um, and we were just a, in a big state of disarray. That was back in April, um, I think, when we had that episode or around that time. Um, we thought with, with all the uncertainty that we're facing again today, and really it hasn't slowed down, that we would have another WTF episode. So sort of WTF take two, if you will. And today we have, as always, Mick Toomey, our co-host. Hey, Mick. And, and two, two guests today that don't really need any introduction, but um, Melissa Smith and Anna Hanshu. And I'll actually let you guys maybe, maybe do a really quick intro just for anybody who might not know you, and then we'll jump right in. So, Anna, do you want to go first? Anna Hanshu, been in the health plan space for a really long time, since 2005. I've <laughs> been consulting in a healthcare advisory practice. Uh, for a little bit over 10 years now, working with health plans, large and small, uh, in the Medicare Advantage space, um, STARS is my passion, but I look at things through a compliance lens as a compliance officer. Great. So good to have you again. And Melissa? Hi, guys. I'm Melissa Smith. Like Anna, I'm a longtime healthcare consultant. I have been in the plan space since 2008. Um, very much focused on business improvement, performance improvement with a goal in mind. So today we're talking about STARS. Sometimes the goal is something different. Um, I am actually celebrating my 30th year this year in the, the managed care space. So um, it's kind of a fun season to like talk about WTF and imagine like WTF, WTF. Yep. Yep. This is the year for it. This is the year. That's right. That's the year. It is. So, yeah, I mean, I don't even know where to start, right? There's so many places we could start with um, all the unknown and what, what's the future hold. So what do you guys think? Where do we start today? Okay, well, this, you, Rex, you named this the WTF podcast. I'm going to just be bold and say I feel like our whole summer has been a WTF summer. If you ask anybody in the plan space, anybody in the star space, we've all got lists that are – 50 times longer than they've ever been, complexities that are 50 times harder. And I don't know if everybody else feels this way, but I feel like I've literally woken up every day feeling like WTF on behalf of ourselves, on behalf of each of our clients. Tell me tell me that I'm not alone and that, um, that you guys are having the same sort of feeling a little bit. Yeah, I mean, the rules keep changing. There's confusion about what the rules actually are. And I mean, just trying to stay ahead of it is, you know, that's a full-time job, just making sure that you're considering everything as we're trying to put plans together, et cetera. And I, and, I just yeah, think like, the, the sheer volume of guidance and memos and, you know, it, it's just this explosion of, of sources to go check and so that you can just stay afloat and keep up with what's going on. And we get so many changes kind of trickled out to us in different places that it's really difficult for plans to to know what is live, what's not live, what's coming, when is it coming, and how is it going to affect me? Even I even feel like, y'all, I don't know if you guys would feel the same way, but when I, when I imagine that we kind of know where to look and where to wake up each day and monitor the newest, the newest of the new announcements, when I've opened up some of the documents, I'm a heavy reader. I'm comfortable in the regulatory reading space. Some of these I can't even make heads or tails of. The OCR's non-discrimination rule, only 184 pages. I could barely even figure out what it was telling me. Last week's health IT like rule. Notes, right? Yeah, right. Like I could, last week's health IT rule was released. It upends the entirety of the vendor space. Again, I could barely understand what it was telling me without getting help and, and support from colleagues. It's kind of a little bit of, feels a little new. Feels a little new. Well, but it's also kind of par for the course. You know, how many 
1,300 page documents need to come out that really there are only a handful of pages that actually impact us, but then getting the clarity of taking some of that language and, and truly understanding what it means, how to apply it, how it's going to impact things. And, you know, Anna, you said, you know, talked about all the sources and all of the memos coming out. But there's also something on the other side of that, like, yes, there's a ton of information coming, but there's a lot of information that we need that's not coming, you know, that we keep kind of waiting for and anticipating, but still lacking in a lot of areas. And it's hard to know and what to pay that. attention to, right? Because yep. Even from a compliance standpoint, I'm continually telling plans, oh, I know the manual says this, but that's superseded by these two or three memos over here that came out afterwards. And plans are like, well, when are they going to update the manual? We're like, well, <laughs> eventually, just not now. You can't pay attention to what it says here. Uh, they're like, well, what parts? <laughs> what parts have memos? And how do I know there's a memo? And so it's really difficult or I think for plans to wrap their arms around that. I think a lot of that comes with experience and just staying abreast of all the changes. It's very difficult. I've got a question for all of you guys. So like, you know, we're trying to go through and, and we're doing the projections for 25, we're doing the projections for 26, but then the changes come out, right? Um, all right, now we're gonna have these revised 24 cut points. And, and then, you know, how are we going to announce that? The, it's, it's official that STARS 2025 cut points are now going to be guardrailed to the revised 24, you know, instead of the original. And I think that we all anticipated that, but I kept waiting for an announcement. Nothing ever came. We ended up reaching out to CMS directly and just saying, hey, guys, is this, have you guys made a decision? Is this, you know, maybe assumed, but, you know, how do we move forward? And they did respond, you know, yeah, it's going to be tied to the revised 24 cut points. But isn't that something that you guys would have expected them to come out and actually make an official announcement about? Well, I assume that's what was going to happen anyways. My big question though was, we all know guardrails is still on the table, right? On the chopping block. And so the fact that you got an answer that said, hey, this is how we're going to use guardrails answers a different question for me, which is, is it still on the chopping block and when, right? So if we, you know, go by the answer that you receive, it tells us that at least for this cycle, we're not going to see guardrails removed. Do you get, do, what are you guys? And as of today, as of today, because remember, I was like looking at you guys. I mean, the four of us have all been in STARS since STARS was in the demo. And remember, before 2018's final rule, we operated with no certainty until after the fact when the tech notes came out. I don't know. Do I expect CMS will give us answers to everything? I actually am amazed they've given us as many concrete answers as they have. I, every day I wonder if that'll be the day that the Part CMD Stars mailbox clams up and stops answering and then we're back on our own. I know. Well, I think at this point you're asking for a lot of trouble, you know, if that happens. You know, everybody is looking for these answers and we've seen what happens when the answers are unclear yeah. let's just yeah i was actually with a with a plan president not long ago who had an interesting observation longtime medicare advantage expert very comfortable in stars comfortable in the ambiguity she said my organization needs a checklist my organization needs the details if you give me the checklist and the details i know we can get it done and we can get it done well but without concrete checklistable answers i don't know if we can get it done i thought that was an interesting evolution in this space of looking for the concrete answers from CMS and people being ready to rise to the challenge if given specifics to, to march towards this is uh, an intriguing conversation so it sounds like for 20 we we, we know the the guardrails will still apply for 25 stars but i mean to y'all's point i mean because I, I i too expected and and mickey were asking like wouldn't wouldn't they tell us that at some point officially like I, I expected sometime in August before the second plan preview that we might get some kind of announcement, or maybe an interim final rule, or, or maybe, because I think it would have to be, it'd have to be a rule, right, um, to, to eliminate guardrails, because it's got to be rulemaking. It can't just be like an HPMS memo. There would have to be some kind of final rule, a second, uh, another rule, like, like we got in COVID, which this whole year reminds me of 
2020 when we were getting interim final rules because everything was changing kind of on the fly. That's the closest thing I can think of to this year. Yeah. But yeah, I thought in August or so we would get an interim final rule that would say, um, this is what the 25 stars cup points will, will be based on. Oh, and by the way, the guardrails are eliminated now. Like I, I really expected <laughs> them to do away with guardrails because they're such a thorn for them, I think. Um, but um, And I still think they probably will for 26, but yeah, we'll, we'll see. Why, why do you think it's a thorn for them? The guardrails? I just think the way they were communicated originally and the, the lack of clarity around them and the confusion that it caused oh and, around the, with the tukey stuff and all yeah. of that okay gotcha. right. how it applied with tukey yeah well yep. but they proposed eliminating them even before the whole mm -hmm. tukey game yeah. situation so let's talk through guardrails for a second because i think most people think of guardrails going away as a totally a bad thing right like they're supposed to stabilize the cut points. They won't move too much. But there are situations when the entire industry underperforms and we would want those guardrails to, to, to or the cut points to go along with the industry and to move. And sometimes right. when that happens, if the guardrails are still there, they can really hurt everybody because the cut points don't move with the corresponding performance of the entire industry. And I think that could be really hurtful to plans. Across the board. I, I agree with you a hundred percent. In fact, this is, this was one of the things that, that Rex and I did like in some of our pre-conference workshops, we talk about this because if you look at like, let's take Tukey out of the situation for a second, you know, Tukey, it, it is helping plans for the most part because it's keeping the, the cut points down. But if you think kind of more broadly, especially with Tukey in, where you've got outliers removed, you know, what is going to cause something to a measure to move up or down five points? I think it's far more likely that you're going to see something like we saw in 2020, right? Where the industry as a whole is dealing with something, a pandemic, you know, whatever it might be, where you see performance across the board really drop. And in that case, I agree with you 100%, Anna, that the guardrails are going to hose you up because it's not going to let them drop as much as they need to. I think that's far more likely than a situation where that much of the industry has such significant improvement that kicks it up. I just don't see that part happening. So I think guardrails, and I agree with you, Anna, that it's kind of counter to, I think, normal thinking, but I think um, guardrails are, are not the um, are are going to be unhelpful well, for plants. And, and are they really yeah, for plants. needed now that we have two key to remove those outliers, right? right? Isn't that stabilization enough? <laughs> I, I don't know, but what do you guys think? I mean, is now we have the state starting to deconsolidate, for lack of a better term, like the reverse of contract consolidations. We've got the D SNPs being deconsolidated out. I kind of think we're going to wind up with a, a body of measures where we've got these underperforming SNP plans that create a new bottom of the barrel set of performance uh, clusters, for lack of a better term, that I think po folks are going to wish the cut points did decrease. What do you they'll have the HEI, right? They'll have the HEI. Right. That's right. They have the HEI, but the guardrails harm. Like the math, the math models. Okay, Rex, you're the one who named this WTM. I'm back to the math models are so outrageous and filled with nuance and variability and variables that it feels like we, we don't we don't have an easy way to track the specificity on these variables. I remember when Tuki first came out. One of the things that so Nick we had. Um, we had Paul on, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Talked about Tukey, a data scientist. And, and I remember him saying, I think him, he said it or, or we said it during the episode, but we came to the realization that, you know, after Tukey, it's going to make cut points more predictable, um, which is going to make stars analysts, analysts actuaries yep. and data scientists even more important, more valuable because – they're no longer going to have to just do the kind of the basic projection projecting because cut points will be more stable. They'll be able to do more powerful analysis. And, and I think right now they're needed, right? Like, can you imagine being at a plan and not having a data science team or an actuarial team or, or somebody helping you understand all this? 
I mean, honestly, we see it all the time. Frankly, for the folks that are listening, can I imagine it? I can. I mean, we, we yeah. all work with plans of every size, shape, and, and yeah. that state of affairs. I don't know how they're surviving. I really don't know. I mean, four of us are all sitting in our home offices. I will say, I don't know how they're all doing it when they have nobody to collaborate with, compare notes with, troubleshoot with, math with. It feels it feels complicated to both not have a team and if you have one or two people to be remote uh, and trying to do this from afar all by yourself at home. Or not dedicating well, those guys to the stars yeah. team because yeah. there's so much work to be done, but they're often Medicon or some other department. Medicaid mm -hmm. or yeah. right, other lines of business. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. and we see that all the time and mm -hmm. we are dumbfounded by that because the what's at stake is so, so huge. It's it's not just the money. In some places, it's like existential issue, right? Because you can't be competitive. You can't last in the market underperforming. And so not to dedicate that level of attention to a business analyst role dedicated to stars, a really good, you know, it, it's mind blowing. But, it, but it's got to be, but it's got to be somebody who like, understands the game too because you know with all of this complexity you know you've got reward factor going away you've got hei coming in and and like you were talking about anna you know the, the lack of information that we all have around that piece but thinking about the with the weight change the impact of these the qi measures it, you know i got a note today um from a plan who asked us to help them calculate their, their QI ratings. And what I find, like, I, I think that that's a relatively common thing that, that a lot of plans don't go into the detail and understand, you know, those calculations and, and how to, one, calculate them, two, optimize them. Because if you're not, especially right now with these, the weight change that's just come through, you know, for every one of those star ratings you move up, it's almost seven points that you add to your score for these QI measures. So, Leaving that to chance, you know, with the small movement that you need, not being able to leverage those resources like you guys are talking about um, can be really harmful to your overall score and as a result, you know, the overall plan. I don't think we do a good job when I say we, like we, like plan operator type star team people in conveying that message to leadership that has the the power to remove that barrier from from our lives right yeah. like we need to like get better at that messaging what should that messaging be so what should that messaging maybe that's be? something that we can all create yeah. we, we can team up to create the business case to present to leadership that here's why you need to go hire you know this this analyst type but you know we, we knew this day was coming if you think back to 2020 when we first went on lockdown and they started handing out the covid relief left and right and the money just kept flowing out of dc like water we knew we'd hit the date where the, the current plan leaders were so comfortable with lots of money and high ratings and and it would take some painful awkwardness before they started being able to listen to that message being ready to listen to that message. I'm starting to get the sense that some plan leaders are getting the WTF just based on some of the inbound phone calls. Some of the plan leaders after the bid season and after the restatement of uh, Tukey this summer, maybe maybe we're getting to that spot. But you know, it's it's hard to ask plan leaders to pay attention to that level of granularity when the ratings are really high and the money's coming in pretty easily. I mean. Well, I think the first time you saw that that kind of perfect storm of all of this coming together in a negative way was last year, you know, for the folks who weren't ready for two key to come out, yeah. you get PP1, scores look good. PP2 comes out, it's like, whoa, that's a W2EF moment. If you weren't anticipating, you know, the two key impact. And I think for a lot of plans, you, you're going to see that to a, de to a degree, probably not as significant next year. So when this comes out, if the plans hadn't been ready for that weight change and they've been doing really well on ops and caps and, now, when it kind of flip flops, um, for for people who aren't, you know, kind of staying on top of that, I think that there's a risk that you have one of those other WTF moments, like what just happened? You know, I thought we were doing well, but the rules change, 
yep. you know? And oh, and reward factor going away. That's the other one that's kind of the big slap. I think that's still, even though we keep saying it, I don't know, we talk about it. I feel like we talk about that all the time. I know I do. I know you yeah. guys do. I hear you saying it, give presentations about it. I think that's going to take yeah. people by surprise. I really do. Notice that CMS, did you guys notice that they recently posted this like, hey, by the way, there's some weight changes, like kind of like a two-page memo. Yeah, on the like out of thing. nowhere. Like, what? Yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> did you guys notice that? I, I was grateful that they did that, right? But it was almost like a, you know, they're, they're kind of like, hey, bozos, let us spoon feed you this that we've been talking about for a long time it's unusual to receive it but yeah. i do think that they realize right like what we were talking at when we started right like there's all of these different data sources it's unclear when things are coming what the measures are going to be what the weights are going to be and i think they were like you know what let's just put it in one place and and they put that out what do you guys what did you guys think of that i just found it odd like i, I was really surprised to see it. it just seemed like weird timing it seemed like um I don't know, just, I, I just found it odd. I don't know. I I, you know, this has been a summer of conferences, right? So we've, we've, we've been at all these conferences. We've been talking to people, trying to like spread the word of the facts coming down the path. I have heard so many anecdotes of false or inaccurate information coming out of consultants, vendors, you name it. I think that, I really do think it was CMS's nod to say, we know you're not getting 100% accurate information at every turn and maybe just sort of doing a bit of a favor to the industry of saying, here's the list and the drama, just here's the list. What do you guys think? So, so you think that there were consultants sharing information that didn't know that the weights were changing? Not, uh, not about the weights, but about the timing of the new measures and the program changes. I don't think it was folks that were intentional or nefarious or willfully giving bad information. Right, right, it's, right. Hard for, it's hard for new kids and new um New, new people to the industry to know how to manage all the data sets and put it all together. You know, I, I often think, y'all, you know, think about back in 2018 when they first put this rulemaking structure in place and how hard it was for us to figure out where the proposed rules went, where the final rules went and start connecting the dots. Y'all might remember uh, Cynthia Polly Martin and I put that one pager together for the first time because we couldn't keep it straight. This whole idea of a one-page summary of things was like a self-survival guide more so than anything <laughs> else. And here we are all these years later, and we all have to have self-survival to keep the details sorted out. And you can't even get it all on one page anymore. I mean, you can only fit the, the highlights. So, so yeah, I, I, I really think that there's so many players entering the Medicare space trying to make a living that you've got a lot of people who just don't know, and they're trying their best. They're doing their best to give a good answer but their answers are just not right. And I think CMS was getting a lot of questions to that effect and just wanted to clear up the, the clouds, perhaps. I've heard, the same thing about, I've heard the same thing about, um, yeah, some specific examples around um, specific measures that were going to have weight changes that were, that, that's not documented anyway, right? But, mm -hmm. but they were, the clients were told this by, a, maybe by a vendor, um, who was sort of trying to be a consultant, I think, and, you know, trying to advise and, but it was, yeah, it was misinformed wherever it came from. And, mm -hmm. and um, I, I didn't think about CMS trying to sort of counter that. Maybe, maybe that is the case um, or just trying to make it clearer for everyone because they know how confusing it is right now. But I mean, you're right. I mean, if you're not doing this every day and in the weeds and, and eating and drinking and sleeping it, um, it's, I mean, that's why clients hire us. I know, right? Because it's, it's impossible. If you're not doing this every day, it's hard to, it's impossible to keep up with everything you need to keep up with. Right. So, um, it is tough. Yeah. Did you guys look at the latest, the draft technical specs for 25? Hmm. They look really good. And what I mean by that is like, there's additional explanation, additional clarification, additional places where they've added details. Did you guys notice that? I noticed they were better. So, la you know, la do you remember last year when the draft came out? I mean, it was, 
it was full of errors. It was full of errors in the in the data tables That's and right. typos. Yeah, and, they had to keep reposting. I think like the breast cancer screening metrics were were in the were on the plan all cause readmissions page or something. Like it was like clearly clearly the project manager who was over that area like <laughs> you know has been replaced or there were a because... lot of changes last year in their defense there, were. there was a lot of volatility in the methodology in the measures in the way you know there was a lot sure. last year For sure. yeah <laughs> I mean, it is a $16 billion program, y'all. I mean, in, I, in, once in a while, I want to give CMS credit, but it is $16 billion. Like, where's the... Where's yeah, you got to get that part right. <laughs> I mean, $16 billion, not $16, $16 billion. Surely there's some proofreading yeah. happening behind it. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. <laughs> in any case, I just want... I haven't checked it for accuracy, by the way. But I did notice that there was an effort put to like a, you know, a significant level of explanation and even saying things like, Hey, here's the differences between last time and, and this time. And, you know, that combined with that well, that's really good to two see. pager document that they gave with like, mm -hmm. here's the changes or this time we're going to apply guardrails to this particular measure because it's not considered a new measure anymore. You know, those types of like important Minutia things that if you're trying to create a tool uh, are important things to, to account for if you're trying to, to forecast, right? Or, or if 5% of your revenue might be at stake and the details might matter so that you earn the 5% and don't lose the 5% those details. Because I mean, not that we have a few clients like that. Are you guys finding the same thing that sort of, again, back to our, our WTF, I feel like we're finally starting to see people realize that 5% of their revenue is a lot and they really need to lean in this summer. New measures, cost measures, calculations, HEI. And we, we've kind of riffed a little bit about HEI a little bit, but you know, trying to figure out how to mathematize HEI and predict and project and, and sort of make sure you earn it as you're losing that reward. Are you guys seeing, seeing the same thing that we're finally starting to get some attention and traction with, with, focus from plans you know yeah but i hear melissa a lot plans trying to like strategically game stars right so they like try to pull the levers and do all the outward actions that it takes but the basics like are kind of left unaddressed. So like an example of that would be like, oh, well, we are not gonna qualify for HEI because we don't have enough of these types of members in our plan. And so should we go out and recruit these types of members? Should we make benefits that attract these types of members? Should we have our sales force go attract these types of members and bring them to our plan? To the, the answer for that is, if you have the infrastructure to serve these members, are you going to set up the benefits, the care management, the, the utilization management that goes along, the services, the, the relationships with the community resources that are needed for you to connect these members? Do you have the right formulary? Do you have the right benefit design? Like all of those things, like do you have enough staff to answer the phone? Do you have people that speak these languages? Are you willing to do all of the things? If you're not willing to do all of the things, don't go out and just so that you can qualify for HEI reward, bring all these members on that you are not prepared to serve because they have unique needs, right? Like that that's the whole point of HEI, can you serve members with these unique needs? So if you, you know, it's almost like that doesn't compute sometimes. Do what you guys hear? Yeah, it, it, it's, well, it's like, you know, if you look at a lot of the plans that, you know, are kind of maxing out the reward factor, that you typically, it's a very different population mix than a lot of the ones that, you know, would be able to, at least right now, get the high rewards from, from HEI. And, and your point is very well made. The, the skills or the capabilities that you have to have in-house to optimally manage uh, you know, the SRF population, it's very different 
than the ones you need to manage a non-SRF population. So if you went that route and tried to add a bunch of those members, but you're not prepared to manage that, you're still probably not going to qualify for HEI because your rates for those the SRF favors are going to be below any of the thresholds. So ultimately, all you're likely to do is decrease your overall scores and still not get HEI. And I warn about that a lot, right? Because those are the members that are going to appear in your measures regardless, right? Those yep. members that have this additional level of complexity <laughs> are going to be the ones that need chronic uh, care. <laughs> They're going to be the ones that that need, uh, you know, preventive care. They're going to be the ones that, that need, you know, they're going to fall into your adherence measures that are going, going to need utilization mm -hmm. management and they're more likely to have appeals that are going to be more likely to have CTMs. These are the members, right? And so you have to get good at serving them if, you're going to attract them to your plan. And mo most, most plans have some, some, right? So even, even, even if you're not eligible for HEI, even if you don't have enough to be eligible, like to me, to me, it's, it's, it's a no brainer for the most part, right? To prioritize those members and because they are probably your most non-compliant members or some of your most non-compliant members anyway. So, so if you need 25 members to move a measure and you have 25 members in this HEI that are either, you know, have disabled as their original reason for entitlement or LIS or dual, I mean, you know, like they, they need the help. They, they need, they're probably disengaged because the whole point of, you know, them being in a health equity bucket is they have health equity challenges. They're, socioeconomically challenged or disabled and probably have been neglected by the system forever, right? So they need to be engaged better. We had a client who, um, you know, all they did was they got an early start in 2024 on this and they, they had a vendor that was reaching out to their unengaged members. And they basically at the beginning of 2024 pivoted that whole vendor to just work on members in the HEI buckets. And they and, and you know even in early 2024 they saw a significant lift in their CAP scores and they attribute a lot of it to that right because it's these members who are historically unengaged you know and and they did some outreach to them really got them engaged and they saw big scores score increases in CAPs and and I know that'll pay off from an HEI standpoint. Um, well, it's also going to pay off from a QI standpoint. Yeah, right. Because yeah. if you're moving those members that traditionally have not, again, you don't have to move a lot, relatively speaking, to get significant improvement or at least out of significant decline in some situations. So that's a fantastic way to essentially double dip that that performance improvement. Yeah. Don't you think? Don't you think it's funny that CMS has now got layers of these these motivational incentives on top of these hard to reach members? It's like they gave us they gave us a motivation we didn't do quite enough, so they layered another motivation on, hoping we'll do a little bit more. And now like this <laughs> exponential power, like Nick, I know your reports and your tools do a great job of finding the people and the measures where you get the exponential power. They're, they're basically saying, guys, these are the people who need. Focus here. So like go 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 get go get the math go get the win help get, help us help you kind of thing. It's hard to do though, you know. We're sitting here talking about data and, and analytics and kind of thinking through the various pieces and parts. You know, and I was talking to this group of, of investors uh, a couple of weeks ago. The, the more I was talking them through these nuances, you know, Rex, I was with your team on some webinars all day, and they both been walking folks through the math. Um, these investors lo looked around the table and they said, "This feels like an analytics bonanza." And all I could think was, yes, it's an analytics bonanza, and there's not nearly enough analysts to understand what's a bonanza about. And we're kind of all sort of standing in the gap during this really complicated math, prediction, projection, modeling phase with all this new measures, changing measures, changing populations. Are you guys feeling that same sort of where, where's the horsepower to, to make the bonanza come to life? Well, I see it as kind of a, a a mix because I agree with you, like there's an analytics bonanza that can exist, but with the numbers, you can get to a point where you can understand the areas to improve and the understand the impacts to your plan if you make it. But 
that isn't going to solve the problem in terms of actually moving the needle on these things. You have to have the stuff, frankly, that, that you guys bring to the table that shows, you know, for this population, here's where, here's how you actually can go out and, and improve these things. And so I think it's, it's that combination of, of the analytics to help identify where, and then the process or the technology or the partners to come in and actually help, you know, make that actual difference. That's super true because, you know, the analytics across the board are the same, right? The, the analytics, the, the activities that you have to do to analyze to really understand where you're standing and where you need to go next, same. What's different is the, the answer, what, what road you take to get there is different from it for every contract because every contract has a significantly different situation with their network a significantly different, or, you know, it could be th there are similarities around the country, but a, a unique member mix, uh, you know, that in all of these things combined, a, a unique benefit mix, a unique, you know, stands that they have in terms of their economics, depending on their longevity and who the parent company is and what they have to play with, you know, in terms of strategy and what they're strategy is, whether it's growth or star ratings improvement, whatever those things are. And I think that all of that plays together and you might follow a different path, right? To, to, to get to where you need to go. And you may not have, you know, you, we talk to plans all the time where we say, you know, you need to take a, a member centric approach or you need a provider centric approach. And it just depends they ha we have to guide them to pull the levers that they have at their disposal. Some levers are going to be completely out of reach just by virtue of their reality on the ground. And so the answer is not the same for every single plan. And they're, yeah. you know, those levers are going to vary, right? Yeah, it's so different. I mean, I, mean, I think about some of our clients. And so, you know, some clients are five stars, right? And they're going to lose the reward factor. They don't have, they have some HVI population, you know, they'll get a little, they're eligible for a little reward there, but they're going to face the big loss, right? They, they know they're not going to be five. Um, they're hoping to be five this year and then, you know, maybe 26, but they know it's going to go away. Um, and they're trying to determine if, is, is HVI, like how, how much do we have to invest to really be good in HVI and is it worth it? Is it going to make, make a difference in our score? Um, then we have other plans that are, you know, three stars trying to get to four, three and a half stars trying to get to four, and they've never gotten a reward factor. It doesn't mean anything that that's going away. The HEI is a great opportunity, but it it they're having the discussion like, can we afford? Our our resources are strapped, right? I mean, we mm -hmm. are so strapped. Like, can we even do what we need to do to To get the HEI, is it is it worth it? Is it going to make a big enough difference? Um, which I think it is. I think again, I I have a hard time saying anyone should not do something to prioritize just those members, right? And where they have in those measures where they have the opportunities and make you call them the bubble, the bubble measures, right? Where you're where you're close to going up, close to falling down, and just maximizing mm -hmm. those, right? And there's a lot you can do. I I think without a heavy lift. Um, but it's overwhelming because of the amount of change and trying to understand it all and, and trying to, you know, educate the resources, their cross-functional partners, their executives. And that's such a big part of it, right? Yeah. I have to say, you guys know I'm a CPA by background. I, I, I landed in quality completely accidentally. So, and Nick, remind me, aren't you, aren't, aren't you from, I uh, have a finance background too? I started out as an analyst. That's, yeah. That's what I was thinking. So, um, you know, I'm always amazed. We talked a little, talked a little earlier about sort of the complacency of folks gaming the star system, gaming the math path, not just using a directional math path. I, I feel like that conversation, Rex, is really important from a financial perspective because there are so many areas that drive stars that if we do the right work in the right way, we will reduce medical spend by producing strong quality measures, which makes the ROI come to life. And it could actually be financially net positive to improve the star rating by chasing the star's success in a thoughtful fashion. 
but it, it is definitely hard to get folks to slow the ROI cycles enough to develop that business case and think through who am I chasing, for what reasons, how do I get them the right care they need to keep them out of the emergency room, to keep them out of hospitals so that we can drive those financial savings to pay for the rest. Um, it feels like we're close to maybe getting back to having that within reach, but um, I, I, I tend to think that there's a fruitful financial way of getting to, let's say, four or four and a half stars where we drive costs down organically. If you want to get to five, I'm not sure I hold that. I don't, I don't hold that firm hmm. as easily. But um, yeah, I, I really do believe smart math pathing is is the way to go in really good care triple triple aim kind of care i agree um that'll just follow right because it's good care but i think you know what you're both honing in on is that you know rising tide in hei lifts all boats not just Mm -hmm. star ratings in general but other key performance indicators, like accurate risk adjustment, like total cost of care, um, like, you know, other satisfaction quality initiatives that you may have going on. I think that rising, what I mean by rising tide is really pointing your efforts and focusing and prioritizing those HEI members, whether you qualify for HEI reward or not. Um, will lift all boats for the reasons that you, that both of you just mentioned. Yep, I will say I've had a couple. I've had a couple plan leaders that finally started talking about the elephant in the room in the last, say, twelve to eighteen months. You know, the, the trick is that a lot of those HEI members have been the high profit members. They're not English speakers. They're unengaged. They're car- they're carrying the health plan's card, but they're not using services. So on paper, they look like really low MLR members. And there is a funky balance here that in order to, to get more care to really low MLR, high profit members, we gotta we gotta work with bigger swaths of the population. Nick, I think like you said earlier, we gotta work with a bigger swath of the population to make small improvements, incremental improvements, bit by bit, not big, huge, bright, shiny boulders, but a little bit more care, a little bit more lift, a few more members, a little less decline starts to get us over that that hurdle. I will say that those low MLR members are, you know, I don't want to say ticking time bomb, but in essence, right? Like they're low MLR members until they're not, right? <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Yeah. That, yeah. that, you know, because they're not consuming care doesn't mean that they don't have a lot of unaddressed issues that then become more expensive to address and really, frankly, more costly to the member in terms of quality of life later when they finally have no choice but to seek care. And I think that's really short-sighted of plans to be thinking about, you know, members in, in that way. I think, you know, the more we connect, I just remember being, you know, when I was on the health plan that we would always urge members that said, I haven't been to the doctor in 20 years, how we would really try to talk with them about establishing care so that when they need the doctor, the doctor will be familiar with them and they can get an appointment, those, you know, types of things. So, you know, we're, we're calling this WTF, right? So um, I keep thinking about, like, are there the things that are still unclear, right? Like when we think about what, what does the future hold? Well, I guess let's stay on HEI for a minute because I know we, 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 <laughs> we didn't finish that conversation. But so HEI, um, and Melissa, you said earlier, like when there's, they have to feel some pain, right? Before, yeah. before they make some change. So the reward factor going away is going to make a lot of, high performing plans feel a lot of pain, right? So there will definitely be some some pain felt and, and urgency. And we're I mean, we're definitely seeing it. We're um, you know, our our high highest performing plans that are four and a half, five stars that know they're gonna fall, um, are definitely strategizing about this and, and they're and they're focused yep. on it right now. Um, for the most part, right? They they know this is their opportunity to make up at least some of what they're gonna lose. Um, it's the only way they can short of just maximizing the heck out of QI measures and things like that. But, um, you know, and we're working with plans to 
understand current performance, right? Like current month, like how, how, how does it look? How, you know, what are your big opportunities from an HCI standpoint, but not necessarily projecting a, you know, a 2027 star rating yet based on that, because there's still a lot to be known. We don't even know. We know the measures that were in the simulation, but there will be some changes to that based on the new measures that have come in since then, like TRC and, and I think even PCR wasn't in there and um, and some of those other measures. But um, the whole two-year look back, which we, I know we've talked a little bit about this, but that's confusing, right? Like how are, how are, how are plans going to be measured on measurement year 24 and 25 combined for this first HEI reward factor? I don't know the answer to that. So do any of you? Well, I hope <laughs> they confusing, right? open up that, that CMS, by they, I mean, CMS opens up that black box soon and lets, lets us know exactly how those calculations are going to be done, right? Because we're in the middle of performing for that measure now. I think it's important for plants to understand exactly how that measure is ultimately going to be calculated, right? We can surmise, we can get close. I haven't met anyone who's been able to replicate CMS's math using the sample data that CMS <laughs> put out. Um, so I don't know. I, I hope they I hope they do that soon. So CMS, if you're listening, please <laughs> share with us the methodology for calculating AGI. Okay. How are right, we going to so combine I, those two? To, uh, okay, I have a super provocative question, though. Remember, the whole game of STARS is make it a blind horse race. Don't set cut points until after the performance period so that anybody who really wants the reward, in this case HEI, is going to walk in every day and work hard to connect more people with care and get the highest possible rates so that like they win the, the blind race. I don't know. I don't know that we're going to see the specifics in advance. I have a, sort of this um, conspiracy theory that this is going to be one of the ones that they don't answer for us for a while. Well, I they make, us, they make us work for it. I'm not saying give us the cut points or give us even the where the thirds are. I'm not saying yeah. that. I just want to know the methodology. We're entitled to know the methodology. Think about how long it took them to do with the reward factor. Think about those reward factor spreadsheets. For years, we had to do it on spreadsheets on our desktops because the actual computation tool was not standardized and distributed. I have this funky feeling we might see the same with HEI for a while. I, I don't know. I don't know. Drinks on me. If I, if I am ragingly wrong, drinks on me next time we're all in the same place. They're going to come out with it soon, I predict. They're going to listen to us. They're going to say they need this. I don't know. And maybe they just think they have time, you know, since we're only a quarter of the way through, you know, kind of this period. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like what we've been doing, because Anna, you referred to it as the black box earlier, you know, there, there aren't all the details, but, you know, we're trying to address that by looking at kind of bigger picture, more macro, you know, looking at these measures, where do we, as, as Rex, you know, alluded to, where the bubble measures, the ones where we're close to the thresholds, either up or above or below, and and working there, because based on the information that, that's there, you can't get down to that very detailed decimal point kind of results at this point. So it's just figuring out what makes sense to be, you know, materially correct to go after. I think Melissa, what you're talking about, the blind race. You know, what information do we have at our fingertips that? can help us at least perform as well as we possibly can on the measures that are likely going to matter. Okay. Better. Should they say? Remember, we have an election, y'all. I mean, if we have a switch in administration, the working theory is that they may evaporate anyway. So, like, I mean, they could go poof. They could go poof. All right. So let's I talk about what, what can they do, right? What can they do? So based on what you just said, Mick, right, I think it's super important for plans to understand where are they on those, what you would just call the bubble measures. So what are the bubble, bubble measures? measures yep. Those would be where, you know, if, if you break your all your measures up into performance in the top third, middle third, or lowest third, which ones are you, you know, close to getting to the next upper bucket or which ones are you close to getting to the next lower bucket? Because right. it's super harmful for you to get those negative points, especially on those measures 
that are weighted more heavily than others. Um, super important to understand where you are in each of the measures. How close are you to the bubble to get to the next higher, or at least to do no harm, right? What I mean by do no harm is, you know, stay in the middle. <laughs> yeah, and, and reality is, um, you know, it's, it's going to benefit the plan the same amount, whether you're moving from the bottom to the middle or the middle to the top, because it's either one, zero, or negative one, right? So, you know, the, the idea that we should just go focus on the lowest performing ones, at least from a um, star's math standpoint, doesn't make as much sense as focusing on the bubble measures. Protect the ones above the threshold, make sure that they stay above the threshold, move the ones just below as many of them as you can up above. That's where at least you optimize it from a math standpoint. Yeah, so you got to play defense. On this particular <laughs> methodology change, you have to play defense just as much as you have to play yep. offense, right? Is that what we're saying? We, you know, we look at it just the way we would look at trying to optimize your quality improvement measures, right? Like you're, you're either going to be in significant improvement, no significant change, or significant decline. Any one of those moves to get up to that next one or at least protect from dropping into it, same exact concept. That's that's how we've optimized that for, for years. And so at least to me, with the information we have, that's what makes the most sense. All right. We haven't talked about something super important, which I love to talk about, which are the health outcome survey measures. Um, I love I love Haas. I think Me too. I'm in the Haas Lover Club. I, I'm with you, Anna. I'm with you. <laughs> well, because I, there is a Haas Leader Club. I mean, like I'm I'm, a, I'm well aware we have some Haas haters and a few Haas lovers. A few. I just think if you get Haas right, it's kind of a canary in the coal mine for everything else. Um, and given that you know now from a relative weights perspective, Haas is becoming a lot more important, and they're coming back. You know, measures coming back, and then increasing in weight, you know, mm -hmm. those are going to be really important things for plans to be thinking about. And most of them, because they're so complex in understanding the timing of Haas, and when you go and you pull your reports from HPMS, there's like, we, we got to do a session just on Haas, right? To explain yeah. to people and kind of like go through HPMS and show how these reports get pulled and what they mean. Because I think people don't understand the different cohorts, the different timings for the different measures. And I think it's such an important thing for plans to really have a really good understanding of how Haas works, at least how to understand your own reporting. And importantly, what can you do and how can you use Haas as a predictor for what's going to happen to everything else? What do you guys think? And how do you analyze when you get those reports right in the summer? How do you now what? What what is what is a what does good look like from an analysis standpoint? Right, like even high level, not not digging into member level, but just just you know looking at your trends and how you perform against your state and in your in the in the nation and where your opportunities are and which which members demographics are uh are helping you or hurting you like what does your membership look like from a Haas performance standpoint mm -hmm. i i totally agree yeah and um every time we in fact melissa you said you're you did the the rise bedrock stuff today right and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm doing the Haas one tomorrow right so oh, good i can't wait to listen to your session too <laughs> and every time we walk through the timeline with with any any health plan somebody inevitably doesn't most people inevitably don't understand it right like like th these two cohorts this one has a two-year look back you know it affects this star rating year the you know the surveys filled it this year but the reports are this year like it's it's some of the most confusing measures that we have for sure right so um yeah we need to show plans what good looks like in managing those and and i'll tell you the one thing that always amazes me again i'm i'm um wearing my cpa background hat here like i i, I feel like i'm gonna like be the dean counter in the room not the clinician in the room the clinicians always love to tell us we're giving them more work which might feel that way we're not asking the questions or talking about the next best next next best best action for both your physical and your mental health they might feel like it's more work in, in the exam room 
I, I find that so many people forget that the reason we have each of these measures of quality is because when we do them well, we reduce spend. And those five cost measures, when we do well across all members, we reduce medical spend. Bladder control, physical activity falls, obvious connection in a process check the box way. The two triple weighted measures, when we do well, we're literally disrupting the cost curve and saving money. I feel like if we do if we do our job right in the next eighteen months, I feel like that like the group of us who have been in MA at least long enough to have seen these measures once will be able to reframe this. That we're literally trying to help people change their life trajectory in a way we have lower medical spend and we can afford their care. Um, but it's that's I mean I have to say it's an upward slog to get doctors and nurses in the field comfortable that comfortable talking about difficult topics and uncomfortable things and spending time. But there's there's a huge financial ROI if we use these as the lead measures and not the accidental measures and forget them as survey measures. You know I I, I was I'm always amazed at um, I don't know about you guys too I'm always amazed when somebody says well I can't do anything about HOSS because it's a survey and only 250 people answer well. Do something good for everybody because that's your money. Like that's your money maker right there. Do something good for everyone. Bend your cost down, and then your survey should take care of itself. You know, but it's. I think it's been learning and growing. Like back to WTF. I think by the time people get done with their day jobs and deal with mixed math and Anna's compliance and Rex all of your stuff too. Like I feel like they're like, Hoss, I'm out. I'm going to bed, and I will see people tomorrow because WTF. I'm just gone for the day and. Tomorrow never comes, you know. It's tough. It's tough to fit it in. Well, and I think historically, you haven't seen as many, you know, plants put as much focus on there because of the timing associated. You know, it's so late when you actually get to see the results. You have to make the investment today, but then wait, wait, wait for this to come in. And, you know, it is, it's not as clear and, you know, clear cut to say, okay, you need to go get a mammogram and then and then we're good, right? This is it's a little bit kind of loosey-goosey on what you're putting in place. Is it going to pay off? And the timeline, you have to wait. And then couple that with when the, the two three-weight measures went away. Um, then you're talking about, you know, 3% of your overall star score. So that takes away some of that. But now that they're back and will actually be three-weight, you know, again next year and with the member experience weight coming down, it does, like you said, Melissa, it represents a much bigger um, proportion of your overall star score. And so what that would tell you, you know, is if you actually can start looking ahead, you know, and thinking about the future and not just kind of what results we need now, this is a great time to start investing in that and turn this, turn this around because yeah. I guarantee not a lot of plans out there are doing it. And it is a way to really start to differentiate yourself. Yeah. I, I, I almost wonder when I looked at the, the NCQA measure updates last uh, a week or two ago, and they've rolled out the two follow-up measures for breast cancer screening. You know, we've used breast cancer screening so that guaranteed you can make a list and you can drive people to doctor's offices, you can bring mobile vans out. We've, we have blocked and tackled performing mammograms for a decade. But what we what plans didn't do other than check the box was make sure that if you had an abnormal mammogram, you had a proper screening, you have proper follow up. I, I often wonder if we're going to see a shift. And now that we're at digital maturity and digital scale and we'll be able to watch those process measures go through the flow. And it's sort of our ethical check of were we banging out mammograms and not following up on the abnormal results. Will we see people lean towards surveys because it gives them some flexibility and a little bit more air cover? where some of these extra clinical measures are going to tell a different story uh, as we have more measurement longitudinally with more clinical measures. I don't know. That, that's my sort of like big Pollyanna vision going forward in a couple of years once those measures like come, come to fruition. I don't think it's Pollyanna at all, Melissa. I think, you know, these are the types of measures that you don't work for the sake of the measure, but you work for the sake because it's being a good plan. It's delivering good clinical mm -hmm. care. It, it's it's how to run the plan. You get those things right, like you said, for everybody or for everybody that needs those things. Um, you're more than halfway to lowering total cost of care and improving quality across the board. So even if, if you worked on nothing else except those things, right? Like thinking through like, 
what are all the types of things, all of the touch points and all of the things that I can put in place to maintain and improve people's physical health and mental health. Prevent falls. Right. And prevent falls and, and mm -hmm. take care of bladder control issues and monitoring how well people are moving. You can do all of those things. Think about your population, your Medicare Advantage population. You can do those things. Give me a profitable, good quality health plan. So I think we've discussed, debated, <laughs> prophesied, like, uh, um, on a lot, right? When do we need to do begged, this again? We begged CMS begged. And once again, please. We appeal to you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think we got to do this again. PP2. Calculations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. I think mid September after PP2 comes out, let's get back together okay. and, and see what happened that we weren't anticipating and uh, go through that part. Mm -hmm. See if there was an interim final rule or some kind of notification or what's, are the guardrails still up? And <laughs> Anytime, y'all. Anytime. I'll, I'll chat with any STARS friends any day, anytime. I would love that. One thing for people to keep watching is um, I keep seeing these OMB, you know, these proposed OMB yeah. uh, data collections, you know, for, for Comet. Take a look at those because they're interesting what, what CMS is proposing in terms of utilization management, you know, like reporting, those types of things, you know, very cool things <laughs> that you could see where the focus is going to go. And, you know, think about that, how those reporting things, not because in the reporting, it's going to affect your star rating, but how those things ultimately do affect your star rating. Well, hey, we'll call it a wrap there. And, and uh, yeah, we'll get back together and in uh i guess about five or six weeks probably right so we'll let pp2 drop and and uh there'll be lots of lots of news then so um sure. anna i want to thanks so much for joining us again appreciate it we'll talk to you guys next thanks. time thanks bye guys yeah. bye thanks guys